Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Privileged to have you here if you're joining us again. If you're joining us for the first time, let me just say, as I often do, we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. Uh, we represent tens of thousands of individuals and groups who support this notion that marriage is the thing which describes what only one man and one woman can do. And that's not to say other things don't take place in society. Yes, they do. Clearly they do. Uh, and that's a liberal democracy for you. But marriage is unique, we believe. And it's not just an ideological position. We believe all the sociological research, the balance of international sociological research, heavily emphasizes that marriage brings the best version of the next generation. It's good for kids. It's good for uh, mums and dads. And really, if a government supports anything, it should be promoting what's best for the most, the widest number of people in society. And that clearly is uh, long term monogamous marriage, biological parents, etc, etc. Now, it's a privilege to have a guest with us today, somebody who is not only a mother, which of course is quite remarkable in and of itself, but somebody who is standing up against the state and against the state's authoritarian approach towards some aspects of education. Uh, Claire Page, would you say hello, first of all? Hi, yes, glad to be here. Great to have you. Now, Claire, tell us a little bit about what's been going on with you and what's been happening with uh, your children's education. Well, funny enough, I'm um, I'm from the design world. I had a design company and uh, trained as a fine artist, which yeah. I suppose in many ways is a it was a degree that was quite close to philosophy because contemporary art. You know, I, I mean, I I went to art school expecting to draw and paint, but actually it was you know contemporary art has moved the had moved the debate on, and uh, I found myself really getting quite a lot of Marxist training. In, in mm, well, life, yeah. <laughs> which I didn't expect um, and that actually was a very good grounding to reading studying philosophy mm. asking because I felt that I needed to question actually what I was being provided mm. um, kind of uh, gave me quite a sort of insight into politics in a way right. so I guess that's been an interest all my life but I, you know I've been working in the design industry as my career mm. um, and then I suppose becoming a mother also had a huge impact and changed my kind of focus um, mm. some years ago. And that that also has that's what's led me to be very concerned about education, because I've got a certain knowledge about the university uh, level of um, what I think is a kind of social indoctrination going on. Mm. And when I saw that arriving in our primary and secondary schools, just felt I really needed to respond to it. So that's why mm. I've transferred over and found myself actually doing quite a bit of writing and mm. recording really of that process, yeah. In many ways, you've you've taken on the state, haven't you? Which is, which is what I find quite remarkable, that um, you are a mum uh, and that's remarkable in and of itself. I didn't think I was doing that. That's the mm. really interesting thing. I didn't think I was doing that at first. I thought I was having one of those friendly complaint chats with my schools, you mm. know, both mm. the primary and the secondary mm. Um, mm. but it, I, I actually I wasn't surprised to see in a way that the questions that I were asking were something that were unanswerable by the school mm. because of what's happened at government level mm. and because it was unanswerable at school level it just very quickly went up to to the education authorities where they also can't answer the questions that I think need answering. Mm. So let's get let's get into it then because that's quite interesting so t tell us what happened over over lockdown. Well, actually, funnily enough, I should start a tiny bit earlier, which is that um, before lockdown, so about 2017, 2018, um, my daughters were at primary school and there I was seeing some really strange um, re uh, relationships and sex education. And that was because the school was an early adopter of what was going to be coming in as a compulsory curriculum for all schools. And they were a trial school. And so they were kind of ahead of the game and it gave me an insight into, you know, teaching about mm. gender theory as fact. So telling the children, we now know, we've discovered there are many more than two gender genders. Um, we're discovering new ones all the time and you need to start using the word they for all historical figures in your history worksheets Good because time. we don't know what gender pronoun they would have preferred. So let's be cautious and use they. You know, this was such a remarkable leap and it was before anyone else was doing this. Made a, a simple formal complaint and found I couldn't get anywhere because actually the governors and the head were presenting, um, uh, you know, material from the DFE 
that semi supported this position to the point that they could justify it and they could say there's no problem here. Hmm. So I had forewarning that something very odd was going on. And then it was in lockdown over at my secondary school, the, the kids' secondary school at that point, um, where uh, we, we just got a lot of politicised teaching. And of course, a lot of it was based on race because that was actually the moment that George Floyd had died, the BLM uh, kind of uh, concerns in America were happening. And of course, the American election was happening, which was mm. all rather tied together. And the school just uh, leapt into the, what I consider really extreme teaching. And, uh, uh, you know, I would say the, to give the worst example, it would be that an art lesson asked the children to make BLM posters. Mm. Children produced, you know, they were at home, so they went roving around the Internet. They produced images of, say, a black power fist with blood dripping down it. Mm. Sort of, you know, violent. Yeah. They produced images of police stations on fire. The words ACAP. These posters were sent into the school. The school praised them, put them on an online gallery, showed all the kids, uh, you know, what, what had been done. So this is excellent work. And I just thought, OK, we've lost again. We've, we, we're breaching safeguarding issues mm. here, mm. almost we prevent issues here. Mm. And um, again, made the formal complaints that I thought would have an obvious answer. I thought it would. And um, uh, and. and I, didn't didn't get a, a reasonable response and of course going alongside of that was all of the social justice training so teaching my daughter she had white privilege mm. um, that she would you know that microaggressions could be conducted by um, you know a white majority to a minority ethnic position um, uh, you know and it was repeated I think this is the other thing that concerned me it was this this sort of repetition constantly being trained mm. in intersectionality every two weeks you know so in intersectionality, let's just for, for our listeners, tell us about that. So intersectionality is a social justice theory created by an American called uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. And mm. uh, she was a lawyer, I believe. And her theory was that we're defined by our, per by our identity traits, mm. race, sexuality, gender, you know, um, whatever words you might put into, into mm. the categories. And if you have more than one of these characteristics which are a minority position or in some way discriminated against then you start to get an intersectional effect where multiple ways in which things are problematic for you in society mm. are unfair um, and this system is very rigid and it goes very much according to um, a sort of inverted hierarchy mm. and at the top of that in or the rather the bottom of that inverted hierarchy you would put a weight a white straight man who doesn't have any discriminatory disadvantages apparently mm. um so uh and then of course they want to run government policy and social manners by this system which to me is is a restrictive reductive and, and foolish system mm. and, you know you might be a short man and dis disadvantaged by unpleasant talk you might be um mm. you might be a very successful a black woman and wish to mm. uh, uh, celebrate your success. You know, we don't, we, we're not in that society and it's an inaccurate and foolish. Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't think kids should be trained that they have that society here. Problems there may be, but it isn't that we live in a fully intersectional social justice hierarchy. The idea is that in order to, to dispel one hierarchy, which is based on competence, they want to replace it, which is another hierarchy merely based on power yes a, a, a power that's being assigned to the vulnerable characteristics uh, power of victimhood mm. actually i think mm. they use in a way mm. um and uh yeah and i mean of course it's not that com competence isn't the only thing that functions we have nepotism and corruption and, yeah, and absolutely and mistakes yeah. we have it all and every society will and if you're so i think immature as to believe we'll get to a utopia with no form of hierarchy um, and uh, you know the, good luck to you it's te mm. that tends to be when we make the biggest mistakes is when we mm. reach something mm. beyond um, mm. but we have, to, we have to have I think intelligent and nuanced ways of dealing with the unfairnesses that do yeah. exist um, and this isn't it this isn't the system that looks at mm. that mm. kindly and fairly um, and actually in a way I, I mean I think I think this touches on the idea that merit I mean meritocracy is a very difficult subject actually in terms of 
competence. You know, and I think Christianity is interesting because it would say, um, you know, all souls are valued equally before God. And we, yep. we don't mind if somebody is less competent. Yep. We yep. think of ourselves as wanting to share, we would think of yep. ourselves as wanting to share a society very meaningfully um, with everyone. So this is a better system, to my mind, for being, mm. uh, for sharing. Mm. And you're, you're let, let me confirm, for you're not a Christian. Uh, you might call yourself a cultural Christian, but you're you're coming at it from the position of, well, uh, almost like the, the classical liberal position that actually, well, everyone has equal value. I, I would say so, because I'm, I'm not a church goer, but I am reading a lot about faith. And I mm. think it's huge, mm. uh, hugely important part of our, our world. So, mm. um, and uh, yes, classical liberal in that sense. Um, uh, I think, although I, I, in a funny kind of way, I think historically we're looking at, uh, we're looking at a sort of cycle of time that goes back to the birth of liberalism, actually, mm. that we've got to unpick a little bit uh, everything that's happened uh, in between um, mm. and check we're on the right course, really. We've spoken about this with lots of people. And one of the ideas, you know, the, often the question of why have we gone down this road that we're going down? And I'll come back in a minute to the other things you discovered uh, during lockdown. But why? And one of the ideas as well, it, it's just the progression of liberalism, because uh, you start off with classical liberalism, but you then want to be ever more liberal to ever smaller groups. And, and you reach the point at which in order for that small group over there to live their life free from the the, the constraints they see others putting upon them, other people have to change what they believe. And that may even extend to denying what your eyes and your ears tell you is the truth in front of you. Uh, and that seems to be where we've got to. Yes. Yeah, it, it's extraordinary because um, they are people who have that view tend to be the same people who say, I want diversity, mm. which is, a, a you know, it's a remarkable error, isn't it? We can't have diversity of thought, but you want diversity as you see it um mm. you know we, mm. this, this doesn't add up right. and then you get the phrase my truth so not the truth anymore that seems to have gone but it's my truth well uh, relativism is a really big yeah. issue isn't it and um uh yeah i mean i you know i i, I don't know my philosophy well enough to be, say that i can pinpoint why we have swapped these these thoughts for others i mean mm. i think i look at it mostly i look at it as uh, geopolitically and try and work out who wants these things and why and yes. where is the, where is the the pressure and the um the pr money and the yep. political yep. will coming from um yep. most of the time i think it is actually you know there's a degree of selfish uh business interest there's a degree of political power hunger and there's just a degree of utopianism going on, mm. a really mm. foolish utopianism mm. as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think um, I think we need to ask an awful lot more of our politicians. I think they need to be philosophically more astute and understand exactly what's happening here. That this mm. is an illiberal move mm. that we have arrived mm. at. Whether mm. classical liberalism is to blame for that passage i don't know but i i think there was some i think that classical liberalism was uh residing in a partnership with christianity which it didn't fully admit yep. and that somehow in partnership we did some very good things as a country there were some things that you know it created a balance between a value mm. system that was actually spiritual which you know takes you over into the sort of uh, into something you can't quantify something mystical spiritual whatever you would call it and then we had um a reason system the system of classical reason which you could go right back to greece mm. and that's coming alongside and i think that created something very special mm. Um, mm. what we've done is taken away the belief and the value system that deals with our sort of spiritual humanity and replaced it only with reason and actually a reason that can be corrupted very easily yep. uh, without without values alongside them so yeah that's i think that's sort of what it is so i do see death of christianity as a big part of the problem and i think one of the things one of the because we we i mean i won't go through all five but we we come up with kind of five potential reasons why we are where we are but another one would be well there's a problem with families there's a problem with stable strong families because you can't really control them you know and family stands between the state and the individual so you know if you want to uh 
in, enforce your power as a state, to extend your control, to extend your influence, well, you need to get families out of the way because families pass on traditions. Families don't need government support. They're strong, they're stable, they're independent. And so they are, you know, a threat. That's one reason. Another reason is, of course, you know, there are those who don't see themselves as fitting in the family unit and the very existence of a family unit, the very thought that that passes on customs from one generation to the next is a threat to their way of life. And so what they want to do is, uh, and the phrase has often been used in many manifestos, abolish the family, smash heteronormativity, get rid of things like that. And, and our position is, so we don't come at this from a, you know, we prefer this, but looking at all the sociological evidence in terms of what's good for society, what's best for the best version of the next generation. You know, growing up with your married mum and dad in a monogamous married relationship just seems to produce outcomes which nothing else comes anywhere near to matching in terms of what's best for the kids and the adults uh, and therefore society. And so uh, things that trash that, things that diminish that, things that intentionally pour scorn upon that and point people in other directions, from our point of view are things that should be avoided and the government should should promote and encourage surely what's best for the largest number of people, recognizing completely that you know other things exist in a liberal democracy. Of course they do, and people have rights. But you know, from our specific narrow point of view, that's not what marriage is. Marriage is something unique and special. I you know I think Britain's been quite good at accepting the thing that breaks the rule and having. I mean we you know we invented punk. We did things. We kind of have. We have a. Um, you know, we had sort of fashions that were disruptive. We've actually mm. always been disruptive to the continent. I don't think there's any, something always bad about doing things differently. I think we can experiment. I think young people will do that. And part of coming out of the family and doing something mm. different to your family is part of, of life. So I, I kind of want to embrace that and understand it as an element of humanity. But if we glorify that bit, and actually turn it in aggression on the systems that, as you say, work so well, mm. then we have fetishized something that is a real mistake. We are kind mm. of taking the tiny end of the bell curve and making it the center. Mm. And we will crash everything. We will harm people. I think it's an incredibly dangerous thing to attack mm. Uh, mm. things that are largely good, even if, as you say, there may be disruptive or different or just you know just alternative ways of doing things that do for some individuals work and I think um, in a way I want to see the liberalism for all of those things taken care of and I think the best way to take the care of the extreme instances even or the alternative instances is to care for the center um, mm. actually have it strong have it able to to consider alternatives but in the strength of the, you know the common sense strength of realizing mm. that children need good caring that two people collaborating is very sensible for, mm. the, for the protection of a child mm. and I, mm. so yeah I, I wouldn't um, um, I'm, I'm loath to say one thing is right and wrong but I am very I feel very strongly that I can say it is wrong to attack the structures that work for people commonly mm. Mm. And I think that's mm. the wrong that I see happening. Can we get back to you were you were talking about things you you discovered during lockdown, which which were not for lockdown. You might not have discovered, although you 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 were exposed to some of it in primary school. But um, tell us a little bit more about the 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 kind of uh, the more sexual orientated stuff that you you enc encountered. That's actually after lockdown. So what happened there was that. Um, I knew that the school had a strong social justice uh, bias, as I mm. saw it. We, I'd been through one formal complaint and I would got absolutely nowhere. And that includes sending those those images I described before to the Department for Education, to mm. ESFA. So that's the Education Skills Funding Agency. Mm. I sent them to the Regional Schools Commissioner, um, who, who kind of is in charge of the school's obligations. Um, mm. in to release their funding because it's an academy school so they're slightly outside of the the um local well they're outside of the local authority so i'd been through all of that process and got denials there was any problem so i now understood that we have a problem not just in my local school which is in lewisham which is quite a left-wing borough um but actually up in government that they can't mm. see a big problem like that that imagery so um then when we the, the kids returned 
uh, they started what was, uh, which is now a compulsory um, curriculum, which is um, the Relationships and Sex Education, which has a new guidance document. It came out in 2019, but they delayed its implementation to 2020 um, because of uh, COVID. And uh, no, sorry, to 21 is when it became active, I think. Um, and uh, that asks schools in very open and broad terms uh, to teach children about LGBT. I, I it really doesn't say much more about that. Just teach them about LGBT. And it also says uh, to, to make sure that gender stereotypes will not be tolerated, um, which is an extraordinary thing to say to schools. The, these are these are huge permissions for, um, uh, you know, for radical interpretation. Yep. So our school um, employed in order to meet these these new guides, they employed a company called uh, the School of Sexuality Education. Um, which came in to do what they call a drop down day where the schools, the kids are out of ordinary lessons and they're getting a sort of um, workshops on RSE. Mm. And my daughter, you know, came home and reported to me. Um, well, we actually I should say first that we were asked if we wanted to give our permission to this because it was mm. one area that, that you can withdraw your child from. Um, and we were told that the lesson would be about sexual consent. So safety, the law um, and that seemed to me a perfectly sensible thing to let children know about. Yep. Um, and when my daughter came back, she said, well, actually, I was told that we live in a heteronormative world. This is a really bad thing. The way we need to respond to that is to become sex positive. Um, sex positivity is a sort of approach to life, a theory. Um, and as long as you are sex positive and you give consent, um, then, you know, everything's we, we good. Have Everything we have no mm. values or consideration about what is the best or, or worst way to go about your sexual yep. relations. Yep. Um, and also, I think they mentioned intersectionality again, which is always cropping up. So it was a bit of social justice training. It was given in uh, it was given as fact, according to my daughter. Um, and so at this point, because we're not in lockdown, I can't see what she's actually been taught. So I just inquired of the school. Can I please uh, see that lesson? To which they replied, well, no, you can't, because that was delivered by an outside provider and they have they've said they don't want to show it to you. So I was remarkable, quite dumbstruck by that. I was like, really, mm. that, that can happen. Um, it's a state school. You know, it's been paid for by public cash. And, and I'm a parent. Surely I, we, we, we need to know. And the RSE guidance is very clear about parents um, uh, being the, the sort of primary educator of children and also that they should be given every opportunity, I think is the word they say, every mm. opportunity to know what they're being, the child is being taught. Um, so I then made, um, well, actually I made a, a bit of a mistake. I was told that the reason that I couldn't see this was because the outside provider forbade it. So I called the outside provider, the School of Sexuality and said, would you mind sending this lesson plan to the school? I really do think you should show parents. It was a civil conversation. And um, uh, the next thing I know is I was told by the head teacher that I had possibly harassed this company by telephoning them, that I mm. shouldn't have telephoned them. Um, and I said, well, someone's got to give me the you, you won't. They won't. Someone's mm. got to give me the, 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 uh, the lesson plan. And uh, so then I made a freedom of information request of the school that was turned down. And last of all, I referred that over to the information commissioner's office so that's the ico yep. who makes the final decision on whether a public service should or shouldn't um you know divulge data yep. in freedom yep. of information and they agreed with the school and the charity that was visiting that it should be kept secret which uh is remark totally remarkable in my so opinion. you're not allowed to know what your child is being taught no nope. and i have not seen it uh i've still not seen the lesson um, there was a moment at which they tried to offer for me to see it on the premises in the it, it, impromptuly. They just present said in a meeting, well, I can show you the slides here if you want. Mm. And I turned the computer away and rejected it and said, uh, no, because I mean, it's lucky I was in design, actually, because what you're showing me is something you have declared to be um, intellectual property that you mm. are trying to keep secret as parents it's not a solution for me to mm. be shown a few lesson plans 
I might need to make a formal complaint. I might want to show my husband who wasn't with me at the time. Um, you know, I might want to talk to my daughter about this lesson plan um, and, and why I don't agree with it, if, even if the school does. Um, so it's not good enough to kind of flash parents a quick look at something, which is one of the proposals to solve this, actually. Even the DfE and the Secretary of State is suggesting let's let's maybe let parents have a little look on the premises at this you know, valuable intellectual property that they're not supposed to see. Mm. Um, and of course, that just draws us into some kind of non-disclosure agreement. Mm. I mean, it's not a solution. Um, so, yeah, that, that's actually where I'm stuck. And I'm, I'm now going to tribunal, which is to test the, the way that you can test the ICO decision is in a court of tribu tribunal court. Yeah. And you've got a crowd funder, I believe, which is raising funds. And that's due to... Uh, something's happening in February or March, you're hoping? That's right. Yes, I'm crowdfunding to pay a lawyer, uh, not me, it doesn't, nothing goes to mm. me, it's to pay the lawyer to assist me to, to make this tribunal case, which um, I have a lawyer who believes it is something of national importance, really, mm. because this is about trying to show that it is unacceptable mm. to keep lesson plans secret from parents mm. um, and that the ICO made the wrong decision. Um, it's very difficult because... Um, I think the ICO might, you know, it, 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 become, it becomes a legal battle. And with all things legal, you can't always guarantee the right thing happens because people are working with these, these systems. Um, what would be ideal, regardless of how the court case comes out, which I hope will come my way, but we'll, we'll mm. see, um, would be that we could have political intervention to actually just put this beyond a possibility. Um, and really, I would have expected and, I, and I, I haven't you know I think there have been statements by the education secretary and by Amanda Spielman uh, of Ofsted um, who have said look we don't think there should be secrets in schools so I'm mm. glad to think that uh, but they haven't shown any inclination to enforcing or creating the envir regulatory environment that insists upon it mm. and they're just waiting for this court case to happen and who knows what will get proven so mm. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the other thing we. I would like to see happen. That's quite remarkable. I mean, firstly, well done you for literally taking on the state um, on behalf of a lot of people who really don't even have a clue what's going on, quite frankly. I mean, tell us a little bit more about what you discovered about this company um, and other things they publish and, and the websites that children are pointed to, etc. Yes. So I think that's one of the reasons I was so keen to see this lesson plan is because I thought I'll do some online research and find out who the company is and what they teach. Um, so uh, th their website, School of Sexuality uh, Education or schoolofsexed.org, I think is how you would look them up. Um, and that website has already been substantially changed since I made my complaint because mm. there were things on it that were so uh, controversial. So the first thing I see is that they have some suggested lesson resources that any school can pick up and use themselves. And they, uh, they were, were kind of um, lesson plans that trained children to talk about sexual dialogues in a way that they felt would help keep children safe. But the, the language was so explicit and it was for teenagers, some of whom will not already be sexually active. And yet they mm. were being asked to sort of practice as if they were. So mm. forgive me, but discussing fingering, discussing what you like in sex, using sexual words, um, and then even encouraging that it even suggested to the children, you should go on to um, you should go on to your own uh, sort of social media channels and start reading the words to each other. So you can practice saying what you like with sex to to really? your fellow teenagers. So this, this is uh, and remarkably this work was um, paid for by the, um, well, it was, it was conducted by UCL academics. It was paid for by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is an arm of the government's mm. central funding. It was also done in conjunction and partnership with the Child Exploitation and Online Harms um, Protection Group, which is part You're of the- You're joking. They were a, a designated partner um, and, uh, yeah, and it was, it, you know, it also told children to look up, look up explainer videos about asexuality, make your own explainer video about asexuality and put it on TikTok or YouTube, which 
for anybody who's involved in child safeguarding, and I've spoken to a lot of people now, um, these are known areas for entry point abuse. Yep. It's sort of entry point for the child to come into the contact with abusers. So asexuality appeals to a lot of children because they do feel asexual. <laughs> they mm. are not interested in sex as a child and or find it embarrassing and think that this must mm. be. Mm. And, and so it's a very useful way of children being able to go on to li- online and being channeled towards uh, sexual discussion. Um, so they think it's asexual. Other people might be posing and, and, and are ready to mm. abuse that. So the idea that the child uh, um, exploitation and online protection service didn't understand that these lesson plans were very seriously wrong um, is shocking. Um, so since then, the, um, the university's website has been altered to downplay the inclusion of the C, uh, CEOP. And um, the website of the uh, school provider has also removed those resources. They've all gone. So somebody somewhere knows this was not a good idea or would mm. be controversial when it was exposed in press or when people got to see it. Mm. Um, so that's alarming that they won't stand by their own work. Mm. Um, also a problem was the practices of the um, of the women who were coming to visit the school. So the actual teachers, the workshop facilitators, they actually had advertised on the School of Sexuality's um, educational website. So that's the the website for the charity. They'd advertised their own private private practices in what is really the sort of age of the sex industry. Mm. So they had websites um, which included selling sex toys, uh, promoting um, uh, porn channels, um, highly kind of pornographic imagery, and things which are just not in any way suitable for underage children. Mm. And yet that was there with a live link on the educational website. And again, this, I presented those images, which are very, very explicit, actual images of masturbation, images Mm. of sexual, you know, kind of, um, you know, actual porn channels leading to that. And I presented that to to the, again, the regional schools commissioner, the Department for Education, um, ESFA, uh, and got no reply, well, got, got a decline of any mm. interest whatsoever. Didn't um, see a problem. They didn't. And, and I mean, the, the, the crucial problem, I think, is that the Department for Education has generated an awful lot of this activity. Mm. They are, that there is a, there is a fundamental belief that there is a sort of I think feminist uh, idea that we should be controlling children's interest in their sexual pleasure and their rights. And you Mm. put it all together and this is the social system we're going to run. You know, if you're taking care of pleasure and you're taking care of consent, the thinking Mm. goes, Mm. we are safe. We've got everything in control. And actually this suits young women, particularly Mm. actually. Um, And that this somehow answers the misogyny and rape culture that people are very concerned is either in Mm. school or online Mm. Um, it's such a it's such a sort of um, lowest common denominator Mm. concept Mm. you know we all know that pleasure is uh, confusing Mm. you know pleasure can be where something is a bad idea so pleasure is not our our thing Mm. to go by and it's fundamental I mean, if you read people like louise perry and her case against the sexual revolution you know she argues it's fundamentally against women's interests too because they don't want to behave like men and just have unattached sex all the time they want commitment well this is of course we you know this, this is where the attack on gender stereotypes becomes absurd you know um i i, I actually i enjoy gender stereotypes I am ready to go right back and say, no, 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 don't take our gender stereotypes away from Mm. us. These are things which if you want liberalism, if you want diversity, you need to let us enjoy and employ Mm. as Mm. we want to. Um, They are part of our cultural expression. There's a a concept that these are things are social constructs. This is a very Foucault uh, sort of neo-Marxist idea that Mm. they're social constructs. And I always think, well, so what? You know, that that's fine. You know, that's fine. We need social constructs to help us with the underlying biological nature because we Mm. all know that the underlying biological nature could achieve quite a lot of harm 
you know, we, we, are, we are animals and also much more complex beings at the same time. We have this incredible uh, thing to deal with. And social constructs are a very useful way to do that. They're mm. not inherently bad. Um, some might be. Some might use some cultures I think we can judge are a bad idea and some are a good idea. And we yep. need to be able to make those decisions for ourselves without a blanket ban on gender stereotyping. Um, and mm. so, yes, maybe the biological nature of women has a factor in what we choose for our sexual relations. Why would that be surprising? Mm. It seems blatantly obvious to me. And it might not be everyone, but it might be a lot of women who choose not to be um sexually promiscuous. I think the point you made is, is very valid, that um, the, the vague wording uh, from the Department of Education uh, means that it, it just gives, it gives access to activists, either activists on the teaching staff or third party organisations, the, the many, the hundreds of, um, of so-called charities that exist to provide kind of information and advice to schools of the nature you've been talking about, who actually you could argue there aren't charities anyway because they're they're just making money on providing services, indoctrination services. Uh, so why is that charitable? But separate conversation. But you caught one of them, and the internet has some very good time machines, which I'm sure you're aware of, which will be able to look back at what the website was like at a certain point in time. But you just caught one of the the many hundreds that are out there working with all the schools up and down the country. Uh, so well done you, and, and hopefully. Uh, you know, if your case goes the right way, um, but if it doesn't, then hopefully there'll be an appeal and hopefully it'll go right up to the Supreme Court or wherever it needs to go. Uh, just to say that parents should be the primary educators of their children and you have every right to decide whether or not you want your child to learn about these things uh, and in what context. Yes, and uh, I think we need to realise just how under attack that is. Um, in Wales, uh, I think yeah. maybe you're in Wales. I, I, can't I am. I am. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know then that um, uh, that Wales is actually removing the right for a parent to withdraw from RSE um, at the very same time as employing some incredibly radical advisors who are advising the government and indeed mm. the sort of RSE mm. industry that's growing up um, on how to teach the children in really radical ways. Yep. Um, and uh, there's a particular professor from Cardiff and uh, you know I've, I've read her academic work yep. she's very clear about her desire to deconstruct the concept of the binary of adult and child and sexual and non-sexual or asexual yeah yep. so um, this is you know it's it's always put in terms that make it quite hard to pin down but some people might interpret that as an as um, as in you know, as bringing about the sexuality of the child yeah. and considering the child a sexual being. Um, this is yep. something that underpins the theorizing. Um, this is incredibly se serious. Mm. This mm. is actually um, bringing about dangers, in my opinion. I think it fails safeguard. Mm. Um, and it's, it's hidden behind the concept that we need to teach about LGBT. And this is seen as, um, you know, I think we need to understand that LGB and T are quite different things. And then when you put the plus on the end, we start to open up the idea of many different forms of sexualities, which actually are to do with, uh, with to do with fetish and kind of ways of, of living your life that have nothing mm. to do with mm. in it, immutable mm. characteristic. They're about choices of lifestyle. And if we put all of that together, um, uh, we, we get something quite dangerous because we're yep. starting to say, you know, um, we have to let teach the children this in order to be fair for diversity reasons mm. Mm. um actually this is this is not the case at all and we're, we're getting a lot about unexamined stuff coming into the classroom you're right but it's almost like once you once you open the the the, the black box if you like of love is love and born this way well where do you stop that you know that argument can hold for many different and you know we were seeing often it begins with softening the language so we're seeing phrases like minor attracted people instead of paedophiles um, as a way of just gently softening the, the whole concept of these things. And yeah, that's just shown up um, briefly in Scotland, where the Scottish yep. police have found it in one of their documents, which got, I think it was passed over from the EU. Um, to be fair to the Scottish police, I think they had lobbied against it. But, you know, they were part of a consortium 
uh, in the EU where all the other countries were using this term already. Yep. Um, yep. You know, so I, I feel at this point, it, it starts to become, it's not a question of lobbying, it's like you need to leave that consortium. I mean, it's mm. as serious as that. When, when child safeguarding is being disrupted in that way, uh, we need much more substantial action from our institutions, from our government. Mm. Um, and I think the EU aspect is very interesting because one of the reasons that we are going forward uh, with this RSE is because it's actually uh, responding to UNESCO's template. So they've prepared, a, there was a template going around in Europe, but it's actually very much modeled on American uh, RSE. It's called Comprehensive Sexuality Education. And that's so in interesting. It's not even comprehensive sex education, it's sexuality mm. education. So this is an already a big shift in, in emphasis. And that CSE, as they call it, uh, is a framework that is sort of um, recommended by the UN, guarded and created by the UN, handled by UNESCO, which is the education sector of the UN. Mm. Uh, and all of the British, all four parts of the British devolved uh, union are um, signatories to that CSE. Mm. So, yeah. and that's partly because we're a signatory to the UN, and and so we are adopting international governance for our own children's sexual education. Mm. Um, mm. This is a remarkable thing. There's nothing more profound than how we engage in our sexual relationships, mm. how men and women grow up and and procreate mm. or live together. These are the most profound yeah. things. And those those documents, they, they 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 prescribe teaching children from the age of three and four to touch themselves for pleasure. Yes, they, masturbation is considered something that should be taught right the way through. Yeah. And also that gender ideology should be taught as a fact. Very simply, the concept for, for the UN and Eurozone is basically settled uh, administratively, at least not amongst mm. the people, but administratively mm. it's settled that gender identity is now separate from your biological sex. They are sort of disconnected factors that just randomly align or don't align. Mm. Um, and this image of the human being is to be taught as fact. Um, we've got to, I mean, the, the seriousness of the legal conflict there, uh, again, I, I don't really know where our British educate, you know, where the education department is, how they think they can approach this and not mm. cause immense discord mm. in the population mm. Mm. Um, and actually do huge damage because, um, you know, you, you cannot uh, indoctrinate with a, uh, something that's not fact. You know, mm. I, I'm prepared to listen to the arguments about somebody expressing that they are certain about their gender identity being different to their biological sex. I would listen every day of the week to their views and then I would want to be able to describe my view or other people's views that they do not experience themselves that way yep. and actually see a value in not teaching children that that's a fact that's um, right we have to yeah. we have to get back at the very least to that point <laughs> where yeah. the counter argument is welcome and you mentioned something earlier on when you were talking about um devolved administrations and the, the idea that when these things are generally put to the population, uh, ex explicitly in Wales, twice uh, the, 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 the new curriculum and the teaching of RSE and, and um, parents' right of withdrawal and that sort of stuff was put to the population, and twice the population overwhelmingly said, no, we don't want it. But they went with the advice of their specialist committee, which of course comprised people they'd chosen to give the answers they wanted. And then they say, well, our independent committee of experts has said we should go ahead, so we're going to go ahead. So it's kind of like <laughs> you, know, you kind of build this independent quote unquote committee to give you the answer you want, and then you follow their advice and ignore the population. Yeah, well, I, I, this is why I feel, you know, I, th I think that you don't get such extraordinarily inappropriate outcomes unless there's something very wrong at a constitutional level. Mm. I think the two things go together. I think that we are suffering from a democratic deficit. We've got some real problems constitutionally. <clears throat> and that's why uh, some activists can make use of this and take control of areas of the population mm. that mm. they should have no right to control at all. Um, and that devolution is one of those problems um, whereby, you know, we, we 
we don't have a joined up system and by not having a joined up system on these very profound issues that gives the opportunity for the devolved powers to frustrate the central power by being different to them mm. Mm. Um, and i think there may be some motivation there i can't prove that but i, I mm. feel there is a motivation on parts of scotland and wales to potentially frustrate the westminster government with well, their... you've got to justify your existence as well if you're just doing the same as they're doing what's the point of view Yes, yeah, mm. and and divergence obviously moves you towards independence if that's mm. what you mm. want, or perhaps towards more powers coming to you. So um, you know that that is a sort of endless trouble for the British Union now, which I'm I'm very sad about because I don't I don't mm. think it's the, mm. uh, it, there there may be lots of arguments for devolved powers, but some of these very profound areas of government, if we don't have the same legal and meaningful regulatory structure, we're going to be having these these issues. Um, but also, I think that there is a, an interest for the devolved powers to look internationally. So they look to the EU where, you know, I, I think uh, Scotland is sorry to have left the EU. And so therefore, EU policy becomes very much more mm. interesting to them and they mm. will adopt it. And, and um, again, to frustrate Westminster. And also, there is perhaps um, a pressure for re-returning to the EU after the Brexit vote. Um, again, a lot of people are working towards that and seeing mm. an internationalist mm. perspective as the way to achieve these things. And internationalism mm. is interesting because it, it wants to break down nationalism. And one of the ways you do that is you break down the family, which is a unit of a concept yeah. of, a, of a national family yeah. based on a yeah. personal family. Yeah. Um, so What's these, the idea of no borders? I mean, no borders means yeah. no borders anywhere. Exactly. Although, interestingly no, enough, the people that want to do this live in gated communities and have big locks on their doors, but that's a separate conversation. Yes, that is, it's a separate conversation, but it is mm. all connected because um, I think fundamentally we are viewing and, and, and we have to realise that some of the forces that would like national borders to fall are huge. They mm. aren't just the sort of utopian teachers who think it's a nice mm. idea without much political thought behind what they're saying. Mm. I think that mm. happens times and mm. I know many really good teachers who are kind of um, wishing well with quite they're delivering radical things but they're wishing mm. well as they do it but I think that there are um, there are forces in business who would like our borders gone mm. um, and for them it's a very easy way to achieve that is by mm. breaking down the resistance of the internal cultures and, and I, I would say I mean because from from our organization's point of view perhaps it's off topic but i don't think it is because generally speaking you find that people who want to break down borders want to break down all sorts of borders they're not just national they're kind of familial they're sexual they're you know age related all sorts of borders generally speaking and you, you know it doesn't go obviously not everyone's the same we've discussed that but um it's quite a common thing oh a absolutely and, and chief amongst what they will attack will be men because at the end of the day, you know, I think there is a, a, a greater degree of protective force in yep. the masculine aspect of a culture. And we see it go wrong. We, mm. we see aggressive uh, mm. masculine force. Mm. But, that, but we would be very foolish to deny the protective mm. and familial and paternal forces of men as well. Yeah. And Protecting borders and pr protecting women and protecting children children um, absolutely yeah. and of course yeah. we and exactly and and that force has been denied very strongly because yeah. there are fears of there are fears of interracial violence or, or mm. cross-cultural violence there mm. are also fears um i think of of the fact that they you know that they might want to determine some of these things mm. for their family mm. and, um uh and so we've got uh, and we have this you know I think feminism as a movement has has gone into a phase that very much emulates American feminism, which I I don't admire uh, today. Mm. I don't think it's um, achieving uh, the things that it set out to achieve, or that the, you know I think it's doing some things that are uh, damaging. Mm. Um, and I, I don't I don't enjoy seeing the degree of um, aggression between men and women. That um, actually, if we look at the arguments online about trans in particular mm. we've got a huge degree of anger about whether there is misogyny and and, and mm. feminists fighting the 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 uh the trans and, and i i find all of these arguments are really problematic we need to get beyond these identity systems and mm. actually one thing we haven't talked about which that pertains to that is the equality act mm. so 
we are living by identity largely because the Equality Act is very dominant in our society. It pushes so, in that direction, doesn't it, in so many ways? Yeah. Um, although, interestingly, it so, for example, the trans issue in schools, which a lot of people misunderstand, it doesn't refer to um, trans identity. You know, it refers to maybe somebody who has legally changed their gender, whether or not you agree with that actually being a physical possibility, separate conversation. But it doesn't agree. It doesn't talk about um, uh, sexual identity per se. Yes, that that's a, a, a fascinating area because... I've, I've been researching that a little bit because obviously, um, yes, if I just say my gender identity is, is uh, uh, masculine, female, or maybe something in between, mm. um, that is something you can just state. If you actually, to actually become a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, it would need to be gender reassignment. Yep. But if you look at the way they've described gender reassignment, it says it pertains to anyone expressing an intention to undergo reassignment, which starts to become very mm. broad. It's very hard to say where it starts mm. and ends. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of argument at the moment as to whether does it apply to a child or not. And that's not clear. The, the Department for Education doesn't seem to be clear. Uh, so it's really mm. reckless law that's mm. gone into place mm. and we haven't got answers for it. Scotland are mm. making their own decisions about it. but. And again, it's, it's, it's whether you're talking about equality of opportunity, which is one thing, or equality of outcome, which is something completely different. Um, That's right. right. Yes. Equality, the Equality Act is being commonly misinterpreted yep. as a, and, and a, a crucial part of it actually is the public sector equality duty. That's the really damaging part, because that is a special clause within the Equality Act, which tells the public sector that you don't just have to um, observe the Equality Act you need to take some positive action to make sure it really happens. So you need to use your power as a mm. public servant to get involved, to make things equal. Mm. In a way, that's almost, it's almost a sort of permission to be lightly socialist communist. Absolutely, absolutely right. Act politically when you're a public servant. And of course, public servants traditionally would all or, or necessar necessarily must be impartial. They're spending our cash Mm. as a as a neutral government which we vote for in service mm. to us they're mm. actually becoming our authority to tell us what to do according to making us equal as they see it and mm. that they've got the right to do that now with this mm. PSP. for me this is again the matter at constitutional level and the way that the equality act is being interpreted is intersectionally mm. so we don't interpret it as everyone's race must be equal we tend to interpret it for obvious reasons as a minority mm. racial expression should be taken mm. care of against that big majority of white people. But you've got to achieve some kind of balance for the greater good, haven't you? I mean, it's, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually registered blind and I always wanted to be a fighter pilot, but it turns out you need to be able to see to be a fighter pilot. And it would be absurd if I was to say, right, so I want you to make all targets visible to me. So we must have an international agreement where all enemy planes approach very slowly and indicate exactly where they are so I can hit them too. It's completely mad, you know, in exactly the same way as saying a bloke who says he's a woman can go into a woman's safe space. No, you can't. It's mad and it should be stopped. Yes, well, this is it. We, we, can't, um, we can't deny reality. I mean, we have, to, we have to deal with that first. And, you know, and... You know, there, there uh, Solzhenitsyn said equality and liberty yeah. have a bit of a problem, don't they? In the yeah. same way, <laughs> yeah, you they know, do. If you have liberty, then we don't tend not to have equality, and if we have equality, we tend not to have liberty. Mm. And, and this is a problem we always have to balance. And in my mm. view, the Equality Act has invited us not to balance it very well. Mm. It's Claire, I could talk to you all day. Honestly, I really could. It, you're fascinating. It, what would you advise our listeners, uh, mums and dads out there, maybe grandparents? Uh, have you got any advice for, for people to be vigilant or what we can do, what we can say to kind of nudge things in a, a more sensible direction? Yes, um, for sure. Ask your schools to see the materials your children are being shown or, or what's leading the teacher to teach the children. So lesson plans, ask which provider is uh, delivering it, if it's an outside provider, and just ask for full transparency. They are obliged, um, mention to the school that they are obliged to have full transparency, that it, um, and that ideally 
they should be doing, they should be asking the providers that come in before they arrive, are you going to give us all your materials and yeah. let's publish them to the parents? Um, let's, as parents, the more we ask this, the harder it will be for the third sector to say we can keep this secret. Yeah. Um, so that would be the number one, is just ask to see over and over and then be prepared to make a complaint. Um, if you make constructive complaints, you are not harming your school. I think there's a sense, you know, mustn't complain yeah, to our yeah, yeah. schools. They're good teachers. They're working hard. You mm. know, um, I, I don't agree with that. I think if you make a complaint constructively, you write carefully, you're really respectful to your school. You're doing a good thing. Um, I, I Some teachers are struggling very hard with this material. Mm. They don't want mm. to deliver it. And they actually want to hear from parents. I've spoken to lots mm. of teachers who say that. We want to hear from parents saying, you know, uh, call call this out, uh, you know, um, May, may ask some questions so i think make a formal complaint and if you can make that complaint go to the dfe copy it straight to the department for education uh copy it to the education secretary um copy it to amanda spielman at ofsted who can't act on anything directly actually um but i think ofsted need to know this is happening mm. so that when they do mm. their inspection regimes they know what they're going to look for well they're, they're as populist as anyone else so the more people that complain yes that's right and and uh, you know, what, one of the things that I've been hearing from government is um, that they, they don't know there's a problem. Mm. Um, now, I don't fully believe that, I'm afraid. Mm. They, they largely created the problem um, and uh, they do know, but they haven't got the records and the political motivations to act on them yet. So let's give it to them. Let's let's Great. make the noise that uh, lets them Great. know. And it takes a little bit of effort to do that, doesn't it? But let's let's exert that little bit of effort for the sake of our own kids and everyone else's too. Yeah, I think I think it's necessary for I, I think this is now necessary for child safeguarding, liberalism and democracy. Yeah. These things are too important not to try, yeah. in my opinion. And so yeah. um, and, and so, yes, it's socially awkward to complain to your school. Uh, it might even be politically awkward amongst your your friend groups. And it certainly mm. was for mine. But, mm. um, but I, I think it's the right thing to do. Simple as that. Great. Yeah, that's really, really useful. And um, how can we follow you and keep up with you? Uh, yes, I have a Twitter campaign, which is called at No Secret Lessons. Um, and uh, the, the pin the, at the top of that is a little link, which does lead to my crowdfunder for the lawyer right. for the case. I would be grateful yeah. for contributions yeah. if you feel yeah. it's, uh, 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 it's got the importance, I yeah. think. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you, you really are a superhero, Claire. Can I thank you for all that you're doing? Um, Hopefully, when you get a, a positive judgment or whatever the result is, will you come back and tell us how it's all going and what the next stage is? Certainly. I'd love to do that. Yes. Yeah. It would be, be a very important stage to, to sort of let people know which way it's gone. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Claire Page, what a privilege. Uh, keep up the great work. Thank you for what you're doing and look forward to talking to you again. Well, thank you very much. Thanks.